Hi everyone, my name is Jason Poa and I'm a respiratory physician and intensivist from Singapore. And so welcome to the Asia Ventilation Forum or AVF uh, podcast. Uh, this is the behind the scenes ICU stories where we invite colleagues and friends to share anything and everything about their personal experiences. So we're talking about heart to heart discussions on topics that may or may not have been widely featured in the medical literature. And so today we are really happy uh, to have Professor Charles Gomesaw. Uh, Charles is an intensivist or was an intensivist at the Department of Anesthesia and Intensive Care of the Chinese University of Hong Kong and the Prince of Wales Hospital. And Charles um, developed the world-renowned Basic Assessment and Support in Intensive Care or the basic course. Uh, Charles is now actually happily retired. Uh, more on that later. Uh, from intensive care because he spends his time as a professional chocolatier. So today, um, Charles is going to share how he and his team taught intensive care literally across the world. So welcome and thank you, Charles. Jason, uh, thank you. Thank you, thank you. So, so um, Charles, uh, from what I know, the, the basic course has been taught in over like 70 countries, and there are at least uh, what, 350 courses taught per year around the world. Um, so I guess I'll just start by asking you what inspired you to develop the basic course, and, and when was that anyway? Um, well, we started in 19, uh, oh, sorry, 2004, I think. Um, basically, you remember 2003, there was SARS, um, yes. and we were... Um, we had to develop quite a lot of educational material um, to try and um, teach non-intensivists about intensive care. Um, there was this rather ludicrous um, request from the hospital authority in Hong Kong that we teach 500 people, 500 doctors how to, to use a ventilator. Um, rather strangely, they asked us, um, when there were actually only about three or four ICUs in Hong Kong with, with a lot of SARS patients, rather than asking the ICU without SARS patients to develop the material. Anyway, uh, so the following year, um, we had been doing FCCS. Uh, we looked at it, thought this isn't rocket science, and they're charging a lot of money for something that isn't rocket science. So why don't we just develop our own course, uh, predominantly for our own use, um, and then we thought we'd just do a little bit of extra work to make it um, usable by other people. Um, and we thought that, you know, perhaps five of our friends might run it in their ICUs and that would be it. But it would still be worth it because that would save five, five of our friends from developing their own material. Um, and then it kind of developed from there. It wasn't really what we set out to do. Um, we were doing it predominantly for ourselves. Um, and, you know, my view of this is that, you know, if you're going to do the work, then do a little bit of extra work and save somebody else reinventing the wheel. Uh, because nobody else is sitting on their backside putting their feet up, you know. And if you can save them the work, then that's great. So when you said we, I, I suppose you're referring to colleagues in the UHK initially. Yeah, I mean, it was predominantly yeah. people at, at Prince Wales, but um, other friends as well, you know, Jeff Lipman, uh, Ross Freeburn, uh, spring to mind, Richard Leonard in, in, in London. Um, so there were a lot of people, but a lot of the work was done by, uh, by uh, colleagues in Prince Wales ICU. Uh, and I've been blessed by having the most fantastic colleagues, you know, who will have a default answer of yes, uh -huh. uh, rather than, than no. Um, even when they're not even convinced it's going to work, they still say yes, they still put in the work. Um, and what we did was um, we decided we'd do it. We sold 30 places on the course before we'd written a word of the course. And then we had to do it because we'd taken people's money. But how, how did you convince um, people 
beyond Prince of Wales, uh, be, because you spread to like so many countries, right? Presumably, mm. there were there were educators around these countries that you were involved as well. How how do you convince them? Yeah, so we had people we knew, um, and of course, it's much easier to convince people if it's free. Ah. You know, most people will give something a go if it's free, um, and you know that making it free was a critical decision, I think. Um, and to be honest, part of it, you know, like so many of these things, it's just luck. You know, we just thought, well, it's too much work to collect the money. You know, we'll spend as much money collecting the money as, as we will actually raise. So let's just make it free. Also, you know, one of the things, one of the motivations for this had been that FCCS is ridiculously expensive. Um, and so we thought, you know, well, we're not going on the same path if this is part of our motivation for writing our own. But so, so many countries, um, there, there will be low income, the middle income, high income countries. How, how do you actually, quote unquote, infiltrate these countries? Uh, was it an active thing on your part or did they approach you? Or? Um, by and large, we uh, don't push, push the course. We wait for people to come to us. Um, and many people have said to us, well, you could market it better. And, and my response was, I'm working hard enough as it is without trying to increase the number of courses. Um, and what was limiting us was not spreading it, but actually the amount of time it takes to set up uh, instructor courses in other countries. Um, so developing that network of people um, actually takes quite a long time. You know, we're now at the stage where we have lots of instructors all around the world uh, and we don't need to travel to instructor courses. Um, but at the beginning, every single instructor course you run, you have to go to. Um, and so there's a limit on, on what you can do. Uh, now, again, I've been remarkably lucky. I've had very understanding uh, bosses in, you know, the director of the unit and my sort of um, co-conspirator, as it were, uh, Gavin Joint, uh, has been very, very supportive. Uh, the chairman of the department was Tony Jin, was very supportive. Um, and we were lucky to have to to get sponsorship um, from a number of companies that was essentially unconditional. And what we then did is that if it was a low income country, we would use that money to pay for ourselves, our own travel and accommodation to go and run the instructor courses. And if it was a high income country, we would expect them to pay. Um, so, um, it was relatively easy to get sponsorship money once we had it running in a few countries. Um, so our, our view of this is always you, you produce the product first and then you go and ask for the money um, so that the sponsor knows there is actually a product. It's not a, I have this idea and it may or may not come off and give me some money. Um, it's, I've had this idea, we've made it work. We need some money to make it expand. Um, has made it much much easier. Right. So, um, but you know that. Go on. Sorry. No, no. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. No, I was just going to say, but but you need to be in a to work in an environment where somebody is going to give you the time that's not funded to actually do the original work. Right. Yeah, I was going to ask you. Um, what would a typical basic course look like? A, a, a number of days, a workshop format, et cetera? Oh, et cetera. yeah. So basically, it's a, it's a relatively standard, our, our standard format, and it's up to the local organizer how they want to do it. We don't, we don't dictate. But the standard format is two days, lectures in the morning, very short lectures, clinically based, uh, and then... Uh, uh, skill stations in the afternoon. But the whole premise is that the um, it's like a flipped classroom. You have to have done the proprietary work 
before you come to the course. So you have to have read the course manual and you have to have done the pre-course uh, MCQ test uh, before you actually turn up. Uh, and then all the lectures uh, and all the skill stations are predicated on the fact that you actually already know the material. And what we're trying to teach you is how to uh, apply it. Because um, I'm sure you've had the experience of, of junior doctors and medical students who don't know what to do, but when you ask them about the, the knowledge they requ require to do something, they know it all, but they just don't know how to translate it into action. Um, so we see that's the value of the course is teaching people how to translate their knowledge into action, not let me teach you stuff, but you know, let me teach you facts because you could just go to the internet. Right. And and um you, you have the uh philosophy I, I assume of uh, education. Um you know what what makes for good education? Uh, how how do you make sure that whatever you teach actually sticks? Uh, do you have a philosophy on that? Well, I think for for it's not so much a philosophy as sort of practical experience, Jason, it, it, it's, it's that you have, well, you have to make it relevant. Um, you know, I mean, there are a number of, uh, and so that's why it's very clinically based. You know, we give people problems to solve that are relevant to their time in intensive care. Um, and so the skill stations are all about uh, problem solving. So either a practical, uh, a sort of practical skills issue um, or a, a clinical diagnostic problem or a, a biochemical problem or here's a problem I set the ventilator or let's troubleshoot the ventilator. Um, so that makes it relevant to people. And I think that's pretty key. Uh, they've got to see that it's relevant. Um, and what we try and do with all the courses is put in everything that's relevant to our target audience and what we're trying to achieve and cut out everything that's irrelevant. Okay, so when we wrote the basic course, for example, and we have a number of courses, you know, some of them are more advanced, some of them less, less advanced, but just taking the basic course as an example, uh, the instruction to the authors was, don't look anything up. If you need to look it up as an experienced intensivist, then a brand new trainee does not need to know it. Okay, because, and that kind of helps limit the, the excesses, which I think are quite common in, it, in, in medical education, where people try and tell you too much. Um, and rather than trying to distill the, the essence. So I think what you're trying to do is make things simple not complicated. Uh, and you know, we know that 90% of intensive care is relatively straightforward, or 90% of medicine is relatively straightforward. Um, and if you can get a brand new trainee to do 90% of intensive care, that's pretty good. Um, the other 5% can come later. So we never look at it as this is the solution. This is just part of your education. And for basic, we aim to teach you enough to get you through your first month of intensive care. Okay, so we don't do things that we wouldn't expect a brand new trainee to do. So we don't, there's no discussion, for example, on weaning. I'm not expecting a trainee of less than one month's experience to decide to wean a patient or even decide how to wean a patient. Um, I'm not expecting them to troubleshoot CVVH. Uh, so these things are not covered in the course. So keep it simple, stick to the principles and explain why, right? So we, um, as a unit actually, I think we've discussed this before, we're, we're not protocol driven at all. The protocol is here's my phone number, okay? You don't know what to do, you ring me up uh, and we discuss it. Um, so we, base our education not on this is how the protocol what the protocol says because we reckon that all our trainees can read uh, without us teaching them um, 
But this is why this protocol is set up like this. Now, let me explain to you the underlying reasons. So you can work out when the protocol shouldn't apply. Um, and if you come across a situation where there isn't a protocol, you can work out what to do. Uh, so that's our sort of, I guess if there's a philosophy to education, it's, it's, you have to understand why. Knowing what to do is not enough. Thanks, Charles. You mentioned that you have a few courses and I was just looking it up. Um, so you have the standard basic. Uh, you have a very basic for medical students, junior doctors. Uh, you have a basic for nurses, for pediatrics, uh, for low resource settings. And then you have advanced basic courses for echocardiography, clinical research, uh, beyond basic for airway management, for mechanical ventilation, intensive care nephrology, uh, cardiothoracic intensive care, many more. Um, so how do you adapt the, the teaching for these different classes? The principles, I suppose, they, chase, they, they stay the same, but the content changes? What was your experience yeah, teaching so, different groups here? So the principles uh, change. The, the, the more advanced courses are much harder to target. Um, uh, and what we've realized is that um, the simplest thing is to target it to our needs. Um, and there will be enough ICUs in the world to, for there to be similar ICUs or ICUs with similar requirements. Uh, and what we aim for, the, or the group we're aiming for, may not be the target group in another country. So for example, the ventilation course, um, we think is suitable for intermediate level trainees. Um, that seems to be the, the our experience is that it's the same in, in Australia and New Zealand as intermediate level trainees. Um, but we have been to one European country where the consultants told us they found the course really difficult. Um, now, our intermediate level trainees say it, it's okay, um, but other countries' consultants say it's difficult. Um, now, it doesn't matter. Um, you know, really, you use it for the group you think it's suitable for. Um, so we're putting it out as a resource. We put out a guide as to what we think the course is suitable, the group we think the course is suitable for. Um, and then use it how you, how you think. Now, interestingly, in that country, um, what we found in the post-course MCQ is that the trainees did better than the consultants. <laughs> uh, so, it, it, you know, it, it, a lot of this is historical. You know, if you come from a system with a lot of a well-structured training program, you are going to come out the other end more skilled, more knowledgeable. Um, the people who didn't benefit from that won't. Um, so, you know, going back to when I was a trainer, you taught yourself. Um, so what we put in the basic course took me, and, you know, we teach in two days, uh, took me about three years to learn by myself. Yeah, you talk about post-course MCQs. Um, how do you know if teaching in general or maybe in basic in particular has been effective. Uh, what, what are the outcomes you are looking at? Yeah, okay. So I think it's a really difficult issue, Jason, you know, and I think to an extent, we make life uh, unnecessarily complicated. So the question you have to ask when you do educational research and you measure these, um, are we questioning whether education itself makes a difference? Now, I'm assuming that there's, there's no equipoise here because I don't think any of us would go and see a doctor who didn't go to medical school and say, well, that's okay. Cause you know, there's no, there's no proof that education works. So the guy who says he's a doctor should be just as good as the one who actually went to medical school. Um, so that's the first thing. So I think we, we accept that education works. 
Now, you then have the next question of, well, does this specific form of education work? But then you've got to compare it to, to something better. Now, people always say, well, you don't, can't prove change outcome. And that's right. But, you know, neither do all these treatments that we give. And so you're really expecting a two-day course to change outcome. Also, it's not a question of, I taught one person in that ICU, and now the outcome of that ICU is going to change. You know, it's simply not possible. So, you know, you can get surrogate outcomes. You can change, show you can change knowledge. Whether you change behavior um, is another interesting question. But in a way, it needs a very different um, research approach to the one we've been using. Because you actually have to change the whole unit. Now, we have done a little bit of, 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 um, uh, of a study on our patient safety course. Uh, and what we can show is patient safety attitudes um, in the unit as a whole are improved for the better by, um, I think, about 60% of the unit attending the, the patient safety course. Um, so this is, um, uh, that's the closest we have to a surrogate outcome um, as a result of the course. But as I say, it is quite difficult. We have spent quite a lot of time thinking about how we could do this, but I think you would have to train the whole unit. So you basically need to do a sort of cluster randomized control trial um, be, to, to actually show uh, a difference. Um, and even before that, you'd have to do preparatory work to work out, well, how quickly after intervention are you expecting to see a difference? So at what, what's your time point for measuring your outcomes? So there's a huge amount of background uh, information that needs to be uh, obtained first. Now, there are other things like these before and after questionnaires, but even that's not quite as simple as people make out, um, you know, because for example, our post-course MCQ, will I set the questions? And I set the questions based on what we teach in the course. And I define the answers based on what we teach in the course, the correct answer. So, you know, my, my ex-boss, Tony Jin, pointed out to me that, look, you know, you could teach a course that teaches everybody um, that a triangle has four sides. And if you do a test of how many sides does a triangle have, more people after your course will say four than before the course. So you can show that you've, you've improved test performance, but actually you've just miseducated somebody. So, you know, in a way you need the, 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 the test to be set, set independently uh, based on, um, based on the syllabus. Uh, and this is one of the things we're hoping to do um, with a course um, on sepsis for medical students. So we have two groups, one writes the material, the other sets the, sets the, uh, the test. So it'll be interesting to see what happens with that. It's a really interesting concept. I also wanted to ask you, has, has COVID affected basic in any way? Yeah, I mean, basically, you know, we, our, our skill stations were all face to face. Um, and so pretty much um, it died initially. Um, but actually, we quite lucky in Hong Kong, we've had hardly any cases. And we had hardly any cases in the ICU. Um, you know, our public health people have done a fantastic job. Um, and uh, and so we started to realize that actually 
while everybody else was inundated with work, we were relatively free. So we set up Zoom-based courses and we realized that a lot of the stuff could be taught on Zoom. Um, and we've worked harder and harder on being able to do that so that, you know, for example, one of the um, courses that we thought would be really difficult to teach by Zoom would be the basic echo course. Because, you know, acquiring the images and manipulating the probe is a very important part of that course. Now you think, how do you do that by Zoom? Um, and what we've done is that we've done it with a relatively inexperienced uh, teacher in Singapore, an experienced teacher in Hong Kong, who has who can see the echo images relayed across Zoom, has a separate window uh, with a webcam looking at the uh, um, at the the person with the probe, um, or looking at the probe, uh, and a third window uh, to actually interact through. Um, and that worked really, really well. So what it's forced us to do is be far more innovative in how we teach the course. We've also taught our nephrology course uh, online to people um, in, in the UK and Australia while we are in Hong Kong. One of the comments from the person in the UK who I think you know, has to have the most points ever for, for dedication because he's the course started at the equivalent of two o'clock in the morning in, in the UK. Um, but one of his comments, we, we used, for example, a, a mobile phone as a, as a portable webcam. Um, so that usually, you basically, you log into Zoom on the mobile phone, so you've got a separate window for the phone. And then we showed the different parts of the machine using the phone. And his comment was that I could see better on Zoom and then if I'd been standing in the room because I could get right up close, I get a real close up view of the machine, which I wouldn't have been able to if I was in the room without pushing in front of everybody else. Um, so there are some things that have been actually better. Um, and the great thing about COVID for us is it, you know, we've always been great believers in, in uh, remote education. Um, but there's been a great reluctance on part of the users to do it. Um, the great thing about COVID for us is that people are now accepting of using Zoom. Um, so to go back to my original story, we taught a course uh, from Hong Kong to uh, 60 train or two separate courses to 60 trainees in Cambridge, UK um, in the midst of their of the, their, their initial surge when they were just overwhelmed with cases. And, you know, and this is the other thing that's taught us is that, you know, in, in a response to a future pandemic, not everybody is busy at the same time. Uh, so there are times when we've got nothing to do and they're overwhelmed in the UK or they're overwhelmed in the US we also taught a course in the US. We taught an instructor course in Athens, all from Hong Kong. And your instructors can be anywhere. So the instructor course in Athens was taught by me in Hong Kong, uh, um, a colleague in, in Romania, uh, and a third colleague in South Africa. Um, so all these time zone things start to be much less important. Um, and, you know, for example, our research course, we timed it so you could be anywhere from Auckland to Bangkok and do the course at a civilized time of the day. Um, so I think it has made clear to us that we can run a lot of education without traveling. And it's been fantastic. You know, we run a four hour course, uh, you know, we shrink down the course, but we, we we do the, all the lectures by, by e-learning, so they're all pre-recorded. So we only run the workshops over Zoom at these skill sessions. So a two-day course or a one-day course gets crammed into 
four hours. So you do two four hour sessions. Now, I can't get to the airport, check in, and then just come straight home in four hours. But now I can run the, you know, an entire day's teaching in four hours. Um, and, you know, a lot of people say, oh, it's terrible, you can't travel. I'm just thinking, so it's fantastic. Didn't have to travel for two years. Um, so, uh, yeah, it, it, it has changed people's attitudes, I think. Um, uh, and I think it will lead to a rethink of what we do. It's uh, very inspiring. Uh, I'm going to say something really cliche, right? It's really classic example of turning an op crisis into an opportunity. And uh, yeah, I, talking about inspiration, um, yeah. you know, you're, 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 seen, you're seen as, as uh, one of the best uh, intensive care educators in the world, right? And, and I'm sure there are lots and lots of intensivists out there who would really love to do good teaching, whether it's at a bedside or in a workshop format, a lecture or something like basic. Any, any words of advice for, for these budding educators? Yeah, I, mean, I think, as I say, what I would do is, is say, look, you know, whenever you write something, whenever you do something, try and make it accessible to more than the audience you're teaching. So it really doesn't require much effort to press record when you give your lecture. It may not be the best recording, but it's the start. So we've, we've always looked at the, the art material as when, we've got, when we're 90% happy with the material, we'll release it. Because that extra 10% will take you another year to sort out. After you've run it the first time, you may decide, actually, you need to completely rewrite your talk. If you've wasted the extra year getting that 10% right and then rewrite your talk after one go, not a lot of point. Your turnover time is pretty, pretty, pretty long. Um, so, and also look to see that you're, you just want to improve uh, knowledge or skills or whatever you don't want to produce perfection because you never will do anyway so you know one skill station one lecture is never going to produce the perfect intensities so you know be realistic about these things people are going to learn from elsewhere they are going to be taught this stuff again uh, this isn't the one and only time. Um, so get it out there, make it available so that people don't have to reinvent the wheel. Um, if you are setting up, you're hoping to set up a more extensive program, the key thing we did, the two things, well, first of all, um, it's very difficult if you're not in the right environment. Okay, so people look at success and think that's all hard work and, and, and ability. And it's not. It's 90% luck, you know, <laughs> being in the right place, you know? Um, you know I, I, and I think there is data to show this in all sorts of fields. That actually is 90% luck. You know, the people who are successful think, oh, it's because I'm smarter, I worked harder. Actually, people just as smart who work just as hard don't have the same success because they're not in the right place. Um, and I spent two years in London as a consultant at uh, St. Mary's in Paddington. I achieved almost nothing in terms of, of research. I didn't write a single word in a paper uh, in those two years. And the environment was just not right to get it done. Um, you know, so having IT support is really useful. Having an artist is really useful. So we have had a full-time artist in the department. Um, Janet's worked for us, I think, for something like um, 13 or 14 years. Um, she came to us as an art student, um, just working part-time. 
Uh, and you know, so much of medicine is visual. So much involves movement. Um, and having an artist is fantastic. You know, you and I, well, I pass you're more skilled than I, you, I am, but for me, you know, I can spend three hours and come up with a crummy diagram. I give that to an art student in five minutes, they come back with a fantastic sketch. Um, you know, we have a picture of smallpox, uh, which is done with colored pencils. Okay, same pencils as we, we all, all used as kids, you know, to, to draw pictures. I've had people say to me, where did you get that photo of smallpox? Um, it's done with colored pencils, uh, you know? So if you can't afford an artist, go to a local art school, ask a student if they'll come and work part-time. And that's how we started, you know, so the, the original basic illustrations were all done by art students working for um, 50 Hong Kong dollars an hour. Now, 50 Hong Kong dollars is uh, around five euro. I think it's around 10 Singapore dollars. Um, you know, you can't buy a cup of coffee or you struggle to buy a cup of coffee $50 in some places. Um, and, uh, you know, you can always find the money to pay $50 an hour. Because in, in an hour, an art student will produce you 12 illustrations. Um, so, you know, look at that. Same with the IT. The first app we wrote for Very Basic was written by a, uh, an IT student from the university. Again, $50 an hour. Um, when he asked me what I wanted, and I thought it was quite complicated, we spoke on the phone. I told him what I wanted, thought it was quite complicated. And he said to me, is that all? Uh, so, you know, these people have skills that... For us, we think are mind boggling. For them, they think, God, really, so simple. Right. I, I thought I should switch gears a little bit and just, just uh, if you don't mind, go a little bit more personal. Mm. I, I just wanted to ask your thoughts or maybe yeah. your feelings. Um, you know, you have made clearly such an impact on the world stage, right? For healthcare workers and correspondingly for patients, I'm sure. How, how does that feel? Sorry, Jason, you, you froze out. I can't, couldn't hear the oh, end of okay. the question. I, I'm sorry. I, I just wanted to ask, um, how does it feel to have made such an impact on the world stage for so many people? Uh, you know, the, 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 the emotions, the, the thoughts, the fulfillment, you know, what, what does it feel like? Yeah, yeah I mean, I think the, the, the thing about it, Jason, is that, you know, I've been acutely aware almost my entire career was that luck, being in the right place, right time, meeting the right people. You know, to give you an illustration, you know, I went to medical school because I couldn't think of anything better to do. Um, luckily, nobody asked me at an interview why I wanted to go to medical school. It wasn't till the third year of medical school when I got into clinical medicine, I thought, yeah, this is really great. This is what I want to do. You know, I got into intensive care because I failed the MRCP and I was doing a, I did a locum in an intensive care unit. And I thought, yeah, this is really what I want to do. Um, you know, I got into research because I wanted to come back to Hong Kong and the only job I could get was an academic job. Um, so that's why I got into research. You know, I got into education because when I went to St. Mary's in London, I was the only intensivist and I could either do everything myself or I could teach a lot. Um, so I opted to teach a lot. You know, uh, as I told you, the story of basic is we didn't really intend it to go worldwide. We intended it to be largely for our friends. So, you know, it's just a feeling actually of remarkable luck and of being blessed by people who um, are quite extraordinary. Uh, and what it makes you realize is there are lots of extraordinary people in the world. Um, and, you know, the, the, the phrase I like to use is, you know, all we've done is allowed great people to be great. You know, the courses would not run in the individual countries without all these great people. Um, and 
all we're doing is giving them an opportunity. Um, and that's really it. So it's not so much a sense of, you know, this is a fantastic achievement. You know, what I do feel um, is that I have set, achieved what I set out to achieve, which was to do a little bit more than my job, you know, so that I feel I can look back and say, I did a bit more than the nine to five. Um, and so I'm happy. Um, and uh, yeah, so that, that's really it. The, most of it is looking at it with amazement and thinking, how did this happen? Because it wasn't really what we planned. Wow, okay. So, so uh, you've moved on from clinical work and you're you are making chocolates. Uh, is that also luck? Tell, tell, tell us a little bit about what it is like to be a chocolatier. Yeah, it's quite interesting. There's, there's quite a lot of, there's surprisingly quite a lot of overlap uh, with intensive care because oh. partly because, um, you know, we do a, the end of chocolate making that we've aimed for is, is the high end. Uh, and, you know, intensive care is the high end of medicine. You know, so things like it's got to be right. You know, there cannot be a flaw this is, you know, good enough is not good enough. Um, it is, is inbuilt in, 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 into you if you've done intensive care, you know, for as long as, as we've been doing it, you know, it just comes naturally. Uh, it, it comes naturally when, you know, a customer says to you at six o'clock in the evening, can I have a box of chocolates tomorrow? And you think, well, I've got to start making them now for tomorrow. Um, and, but the answer is yes, because that's what you've been used to. You know, somebody comes to you at six o'clock and um, something needs to be sorted out. The answer is yes. Um, um, so it, it's, 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 you know, those sorts of things, those attitude things are, are normal. I was talking to you about the chocolate mooncakes. You know, the um, the week before Mid Orphan Festival, I slept on average three hours a night. Um, if you're from intensive care, well, okay, you know that's all right. You know, can manage that for a week. Uh, I wouldn't want to do it long term, but I can manage. Um, you know, if there's a problem, fine, we'll sort it. Um, you know, so. A lot of these sort of attitude issues um, just carry over. I would have trouble making Hershey bars, you know. Um, it, it's too, it's too, too much the other end of the spectrum. Just knock it out, high volume. Who cares about the quality? Uh, can't do that. But you know, so. You know, if anyone else is thinking about what to do after a time, pick something that's, you know, sufficiently like what you've been doing for the last 20 years. But, you know, something where you just say that will do, doesn't matter, probably isn't going to work for most into retired intensivists. Um, and then the, but, you know, the other great thing about it, of course, is it's sufficiently different. Um, so, you know, the whole, chocolate making process is 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 interesting because it's different the whole issue of running a business is interesting because it's different you know I, I don't know about you but but for me you know conferences have got to the point where I learn relatively little from a conference so if I go to a conference and I have a day where I think I learn 15 minutes worth of new stuff in the entire day. I think that's a fantastic day. If I listen to a lecture on marketing for 15 minutes, I learn 15 minutes worth. Um, so the whole thing of it all being new is really invigorating. Um, and, um, you know, the, you just learn something every day, which, which is great. Um, the other thing is that, you know, uh, um, 
I, I think it's important that you set a date for retirement and you plan for it. Um, and uh, I've often described medicine as, or certainly in intensive care, which is a very team-based thing, of being a bit like a relay race. So you hand over to somebody else. And, you know, rather like a relay race, when you get to that handover point, you should not be able to run anymore. If you think, well, I could run another 100 meters, then you didn't run fast enough. You know, so you should get to the, the end and think, I feel like falling over. And I got to the end and I felt like I feel like falling over. Uh, and, um, and now, because of that, because I sort of spent every last drop of energy I had on medicine, I don't miss it at all um, because it was enough um, and I don't need to have more of it. Wow, thanks, thanks Charles. Um, you ran a good race. <laughs> well, I ran as fast as I could. That's the other thing about feeling exhausted. You know, you ran as fast as you could. Whether you ran very well is a different issue. But all you can really expect from yourself is that you've had ran as fast as you could. You know, I'll never be Usain Bolt. I'll never be a John Marshall. I'll never be a Jean-Louis Vessel. However hard I try. Um, but I ran as fast as I could. Yes. And, and I would say that you ran a very, very good race. <laughs> So th thank you very much, Charles. And uh, I, I think with that, um, we'll end the podcast, uh, but we'll keep in touch and I'll probably buy your chocolates yeah, one day. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, I just wanted to uh, conclude by telling the audience that um, this, this podcast is available at uh, YouTube and Spotify. You can find the links on our Asia Ventilation Forum uh, Facebook page as well. And if you like it, uh, just like it, uh, share it with your friends, subscribe, turn on notifications on your social media platforms, and there'll be more to come. So thank you again, uh, Charles. Really, really enjoyed this talk. Thank you, Jason. Take care. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.